Have your way, have your way, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and have your way, as we wait, and as we pray. Uh, magandang buhay everyone. Let us start our service with prayer. Amen. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, yes. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to gather together to hear your precious words. Yes. Thank you for your message today. Amen. May we can use it in our daily life. Amen. Grant me wisdom and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Without you, I am nothing. Amen. Bless all the members of this congregation. Yes. Bless all the viewers that are very eager to watch this message. Amen. This is what I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sunday, everyone. Amen. Welcome to Temple of God International. As we come together for worship and fellowship, we're delighted to have each of you with us, Amen. gathering as a community of faith, you must be prepared to open your hearts and allow them to receive the blessing of this sacred period of unity. Amen. Let us come to our tithes and offering and it's all about how strong is your faith in God. And mm, according to the Bible in uh, Psalm uh, chapter 116 verses 1 to 2, I love, it says, I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my supplications, because He has inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call upon Him as long as I live. In the opening of this verse is about the expression of God's love for us. He knows that I love Him because He heard my voice and supplication. The psalmist simply promises 
to call him as long as he lived. He pledges his fidelity and loyalty to God. Talking about our faith in God, the very strong foundation of it is the strength of love and affection. In our giving, of course, if there is love and affection in our giving, it springs up spontaneously without command. We give willingly because when you love, you care, always thinking what you can offer to give. We willingly and cheerfully give gifts for all our answered prayers. When loving the Lord, also, we need to love His laborers. We need to express our love to each of His servants, to all our brothers and sisters in Christ. And for those servants who have ambitions, but they abandon their dreams, they have jobs, but they love it and serve God. God is their first priority. This is the beat of their heart. He is not obliged to do that, but because he loves God and cares for Him, he is doing this in order to glorify and magnify God. From where you started and where you are now, or how He blessed you by experiencing God's blessing, can you imagine that? Example, in courtship talk, as for ladies, do you, do you love the man right away? But you feel his effort, of course. As for man, he felt that even you are far away, you were near willing to reach you. Malayo man, malapit rin, pilit pa mararating. This is how God loved us. We love God because He first loved us. God love is revealed to us. God feels and hears our report. The Bible says in Psalm uh, chapter 116, verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The word gracious here refers to God's merciful forgiveness, and the word righteous refers to His faithfulness. The fact that He keeps His words, grace is His unmerited favor. What do you don't deserve, but He made you worthy? In fact, we are unlovable, but He made us lovable. For example, at some point, we are all sinners that are to be sent to hell, but by His mercy, He delivered us from hell. These are scenarios in Christian fellowship meeting or services where you are inviting someone to attend, but they just ignore you or have excuses saying, maybe next time I'm so busy or if I have time. But not this psalmist. Because of his realization of God's grace, love and mercy, it is not a problem. And also when we talk about offering, Christians who have love and affection are very willing to share for their offerings. This is the right way of thinking. Amen. And in 2 Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Apostle Paul points here is, through us to provide evidence of God's grace through His believers, their own generosity is giving funds to the collection. He teaches that the choice to freely give money is to meet the needs of other believers is evidence that He gives, that the givers have themselves received God's grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, uh, chapter 8, verse 2 to 4, let me read it to you. Does that in a great trial of, of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality? 
For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. In these verses, the Corinthians are being asked to follow through on their commitment to give funds to the collection for the suffering Christians in Jerusalem. He is pointing out how the churches in Macedonia have already given generously for the collection. Christians who give without constraint contribute to the cause of Christ, nor do they plead poverty as an excuse not to give to the part for a special purpose. Remember, if your giving is not in your heart, you will stumble. Amen. If you are looking at the value of what you give, you will be hindered. Uh, as like as uh, Mary and Judas Iscariot, this is an illustration. What is the difference between Judas and Mary? Who gave the expensive ointment? Of course, Mary. How much is the ointment? It is so expensive to the eyes of Judas. Did Judas give anything? No. Yet he was so affected by Mary's giving, saying, It is such a big waste. As for Mary, the true love and care for God is to serve Him, giving all what she can. The, Im the importance of the Lord is her priority. Amen. And in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 5, And not only as we have hope, but they first give themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. What does this mean? Example, you share the gospel to somebody and surely you will have great hope in continuously praying that the person who received God's grace and the message of salvation through you will truly be born again and glorify and serve God first and above all and then the brethren showing God's true love working in him uh, in 2nd Corinthians uh, chapter 8 verse 7 but as you abound in everything in faith in speech in knowledge in all diligence and in your love for us see that you bound in this grace also and also in uh, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 29, verse 3, Moreover, because I have set the affection of the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God over and above all that have prepared for the holy house my own special treasure of gold and silver. In the context of crafting the temple for the Lord, King David expresses both his gratitude and a call to action to the congregation. As he transitioned leadership to his son Solomon, David acknowledged Solomon's youth and the enormity of the task at hand constructing a dwelling place for God. In this message, God showed his faith and trust to man, his creation to build him a house, although he knew they will defile it. But as God gave and continued to love and extend his mercy to us, we like brother King David should have the strength of generous giving, having the love, affection, sacrifice, and loyalty to God. Amen. Thank you very much for watching. To God be the glory.
Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we offer you our lives. So, uh, again, uh, welcome to our Sunday, Blessed Sunday in Lord, you know, Blessed Sunday service. So, let's welcome our dear brother RJ and JR for our worship song. Thank you. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in His heart of mine. God is good all the time. And through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. If you walk in. Shadows all around Do not fear He will guide you He will keep you safe and sound For oh, He has promised He never leave you No forsake you And His word is true God is good All the time For the song of praise In His heart of mind God is good All the time Oh, praise in his heart, my God. 
same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man, which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Welcome again. And yes, God is good all the time. Let's pray as we come to our... Uh, main uh, sharing today. Father, into your hands we commit our hearts, mind, and soul, Lord, that your holy and precious spirit will teach us, guide us, and lead us, and even rebuke us with your words of truth. Let your truth be revealed and be said righteously according to your perfect will, Lord. Let us all fully understand, accept the reality and truth of your precious words, and help us and even make us follow and obey them. Let us all be open and united to accept and let us all be ready to repent and make things right before you, Lord. This we pray in our Lord Jesus Christ's most precious and powerful name. And we all say, Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, God is good all the time. The parable of the wheat and tares, you know. Good seed or bad seed? Where do you belong? You know, let me boldly declare first. God is good all the time and all the time God is good, you know. God is purely good all the time, and it is His desire to share that goodness to us. As what Jeremiah 29, 11 said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. And this is the heart of God, to give all the goodness to His children. The Bible is especially made for all believers, but mostly, importantly, for the true believers meaning for the true children of God. As I always say that the Bible is the basic instruction before living earth, for all true believers only, or to those who seriously seek the truth of God. Because the Bible is definitely useless to the unbelievers and also to unfaithful Christians. To them, this is very precious book is just a mere book, an ordinary book of men that they can choose to follow or not to follow as they desire. And all the parables in the Bible are for believers to understand. 
as what the Lord Jesus said, that its meaning and mysteries are given to all his true disciples. Are you one of them? Then you will surely understand what the bar parable truly means. You know, you will not have a problem understanding its real message or meaning, being a true disciple or true Christian. Now, I say personally that the parables are so easily to understand because it is the Holy and precious Spirit of God that teaches us and gives us the true meaning of it. And these are all for our guidance and for protection, to keep us away from all the wiles and plans of the devil, Satan, whose only aim is to draw us away from God and lose our salvation. Mind you, yes, you can lose your salvation if you will not stay strong enough to endure to the end. And a true born-again Christian are reborn to endure to the end. You are born again to be an overcomer. And this is ultimately the most important character of a true born-again Christian. He or she are reborn to endure to live forever with God. To overcome and endure this world of temptations, deceptions, persecutions, and even tribulations. As the Lord Jesus had overcome the world, we also as true Christians will overcome it because we belong to God. And He is with us. Amen? John 16.33 said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 1 John 5.4 said, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And the parable of the wheat and tares talks about those that belong to God and are not. In a nutshell, the parable clearly shows the distinction of those that is truly born of God and those who are born of the devil, those that God is their sower and those that Satan sowed them. 1 John 5, 18 to 20 said, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. First John 3, 7-9 said, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who, is, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Again, just to let you know, who is a sinner? A sinner is one who practices sin, meaning he or she does an evil or wicked act again and again. It does not, doesn't matter how often or seldom you do it. Repeated act is practice. So if you do a sin repeatedly, then you are a sinner. You are just mocking God, you know, and definitely is not a true child of God because there is no sin that a true child of God cannot overcome or shun away because God is his or her strength and power to say not no to sin. You will surely overcome sin if God is with you. That's true. So let's read the parable of the wheat and tares and discover for yourself who is your sower? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ, your sower, or is it Satan? Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. And our Lord Jesus Christ explained it in Matthew 13, 37-43. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is of the Son of Man, is the Son of Man. 
The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the reapers are the angels. No. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Truthful information to know and understand in the parable. The sower is the son of man, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. These are the children of God, the true disciples for our Lord Jesus Christ. Tares, these are the sons of the devil, Satan. Children of this world who disobeys God's words and will. The field, this wicked world or generation. Enemy is Satan, the devil, who sowed the tares and, and, and the sons of the devil, so to speak. Harvest are the end of the age. The return of our Lord Jesus Christ to destroy the world. And the reapers are the angels of God. I would like to give a short prayer. Father, I truly hope and pray that all of us here can clearly see the richness and completeness of the message of this parable. In Jesus' mighty name and powerful name, I pray. Amen. The parable begins with sowing of good seeds by a man, which the Bible says the Son of Man, our Lord Jesus Christ, while his enemy Satan sowed bad seeds. And this kind of scenario already happened even from the very beginning of creation. You know, in the beginning, the sowing of good and bad seeds already happened in the Garden of Eden. The good seed from God, the tree of life, and one being evil from Satan, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus Christ, God the Son, like God the Father, will never sow bad seed, nor create evil even from the very beginning. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ, like His Father, has no other desire but to bring righteousness, goodness, and salvation to men. That's why He died for us. Another way, you know, a uh, very important truth uh, to, to, for all of us is that Christians should know about the goodness from God and about God who is very pure. Genesis 1.31 said that everything that He has created are very good. God saw all that He had made and it was very good. Not just good, very good. And there was evening and there's morning, the sixth day. When He says it's good, it's good, purely good, no evil. Meaning, meaning anything you consider good, if combined or mixed with evil, is surely evil in God's sight. So as to man, we cannot be good and evil at the same time. We cannot serve God and Satan at the same time. We cannot serve two masters at the same time. You cannot walk with God while holding hands with the devil. There's no unity between good and evil, believe me. And you cannot be a friend of God and a friend of this wicked world at the same time which many so-called Christians are doing, believing in their own thinking that it is okay with God, but it's not. And I would like to warn you all, compromising and lukewarm Christians out there, that the gate of hell is very near you if you are a lukewarm or compromising Christian. If you die in this mix and much system of righteousness, then you will surely go to hell. Revelation 3, 15 to 16 said that God hates those Look warm, Christian. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Just imagine that. God vomiting you or rejecting you. That could be scary, isn't it? And this scenario of goodness and being mixed with evil to deceive man has been done by the very, in the very beginning by Satan, who sows or the author of all evil in this world. Genesis 2, 9 says, The Lord God had made all trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. You know, God will never reprimand or will never uh, hold back man to eat from that tree. If that tree is good, isn't it? If 
because he said he will surely die if you eat of it. Genesis 3, 1 to 6 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree desirable to make one wise, she, she took it, its fruit, and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. I want you all you know, to be aware, dearly beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, that Satan still using this technique today. The same technique that he has used to tempt and deceive Eve before and even try to deceive our Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness. You know, lies and deception. Making the trying to show things look like it is good, but not really. In fact, it will kill and destroy you in the end. So beware of Satan because he doesn't have much time. He really has so desperate to destroy all people of the world, especially Christians. 1 Peter 5, 8 said, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. God didn't and will never create evil even from the very start. He even doesn't want men to know or even think about evil. But it was Satan the devil who through deceptive light and confusion, making use of the weakness of man, did his plan. Plan to kill, steal, and destroy man's eternal destiny with God. From the very beginning, man thought that knowing both good and evil is wisdom. Wrong conception. In fact, this is the biggest mistake of man. Thinking that knowing both good and evil is power. The greatest deception of the devil that confused, trapped, and destroyed mankind. And sadly, still working tremendously and successfully in this wicked world, in this generation of ours. Proverbs 14, 12 said, There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. The tendency of most people of the world is to do evil as they know them. You know, one true and faithful Christians will shun evil as they know them. Because they know that knowing that doing evil displeases God. And true children of God have the heart to please God all the time. And this is their aim because they knew that pleasing God means great blessing, you know. And there are lots of evil knowledge acts and s that seems good to many, but the truth is that an, it is an abomination towards God, like abortion, which to many are good, but in reality is murder. Contraception is again God's will for men to multiply. You know, euthanasia is what they call mercy killing, which is in truth also murder. No man has the right to take other person's life unless you are defending yourself. Because self-defense is something that is uh, acceptable, you know. God even have in the Old Testament had city of refuge where an innocent or unintentional killing you can be dead. Exodus 20, 13 said, you shall not murder. That's the, you know, uh, I think uh, six, the sixth uh, commandment in the Bible. Homosexuality is rapidly escalating as well, being accepted, which is an abomination against God, creation of men and women only. Defending your homosexuality is stating that God made a mistake about your gender. God never created any homosexual. Same-sex marriages, man and man, woman and woman, also a great abomination to God's perfect order of marriage between man and woman only, is now becoming an acceptable ordinance by man. Fornication or sexual immorality. Sad to say, but this is probably one of the most common sin that the world today will be guilty of, especially the young generations. Today, fornication is just a normal act, accepted by many, but I call it personal prostitution. Young guys and ladies having sex without marriage, and to many having boyfriends or girlfriends is just like changing clothes, prostituting themselves to sex. How often or seldom? I have no idea. I call them personal prostitutes because they give sex for free. 
thinking that it is love. I don't intend to offend, but this truth will offend you if you are really guilty. I say to those who are doing this personal prostitution out of love, well, you're just foolishing, you're, you're, you're fooling yourselves. You, you know, you are no better than those professional prostitutes who give sex for money. In fact, they're better than you, as I said, because they gain something out of it. But you gain nothing but most of the time, misery and sorrow after the breakup. Some even commit suicide, believe me, because of being heartbroken, deceived by a boyfriend who is Satan's advocate, I say. Truly sad. So I say to you all ladies who are, has the concern and care about their sexuality and eternity in heaven, marriage is the key to righteous relationship that God approves. If the guy you like has no eye or intention for this, then surely he is not serious in your relationship and will just make you his personal prostitute. Get out of it. Dump him and save yourself from hell. Look for someone who will bring you closer to God because sexual immoral will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, suicide bombings, a form of killing by number, sadly an ideology and spiritual belief that is being practiced by other religion in the present time. To kill or murder innocent people can't be in any way good and acceptable, whatever your reason is. We are not at war at, at, that may justify your evil act. Evolution is, to many is a factual knowledge that is so acceptable to most people of the world. Many Christians even try to combine them with God's creation process as something that is more better knowledge than the Bible says and declares. Don't you know that you need more than faith to believe this damn stupid and very dangerous theory of evolution? Sorry for saying that, but that's true. It is a stupid theory. Evolution theory says that all the matters in this universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, and the entire solar system came from a very small dot, which is not bigger than a period in a sentence. Can you imagine that? They said that something exploded and called it a Big Bang and made all those stars, moons, and galaxies, Milky Ways, and Sun, and all other heavenly bodies that you see up there having their own proper courses rotating in axis and they may, that, so that they may not collide with each other. It created and put itself there, you know, which happens a billion years ago. That's what they believe. But can you believe that? That surely an overcrowded dot if they call, call, all came from that, that smaller than, you know, uh, in the statement of a page. And what exploded, by the way? What made it explode? They don't know. Funny, isn't it? They cannot explain. Don't you know that you need so much energy to create such great explosion? Then where does the energy came from? And where does all the matters came from? Do you know how big is the sun? How possible is it for the sun to be in that area as small as a dot? It seriously takes more than faith to believe this kind of impossibility. This is not just crazy theory, it surely is so a stupid theory. You can even make a camel pass through an eye of the needle, now this. Now speaking about this theory about man, using their magic word billions of years ago, the truth is that without the billions of years, the theory will simply collapse. They said life on earth started to replicate in a form of a soup or a microorganism. That organism started evolving and became an amphibian and started to have legs and walk on land. And from there evolved continuously to several kinds of animals and we knew until it evolved to become a monkey. What they so called our ancestors. That the monkey found somebody to marry and here we are now, man and woman. The theory says we all came from a monkey. If a frog turns into a prince once upon a time, they call it fairy tale, isn't it? But if a monkey turns into a prince with billions of years ago, they call it science. And it's all over the world science books that indoctrinate most kids of the world. And this destroys every faith of every kid that would believe, that would read it in this great, great lights and stupidity. No wonder, you know, so many atheists and unbelievers in the world today. Sorry, but, you know, to me, they're all simply deceived and became stupid as well. 
Believing in a very stupid theory makes you stupid too, doesn't it? I say no wonder not only that a lot of people look like monkeys today, but also many people act and behave like animals. Well, in this point, maybe the theory are true. Do you behave like animals too? What do you think? But as for me and my house, we were all created by an omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign God who created man in his own magnificent image and likeness, who also with one spoken word created everything in the universe. Don't you know that the universe means uni, one, and verse, spoken word? God said, let there be light, and there it is. The sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, the sea, and everything in the universe and in the air. And for me, this is the most sensible and truthful process of how life came to be. There is a God who created everything and put it all together in perfect harmony. And so for all those who are in this world, being a friend of this world, meaning doing all the abominations against God's righteousness and holiness, be warned for you will be nullified to enter the kingdom of God. No unrighteous or sinful being will enter heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 said, Do you not know that the unrighteous will, will, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor uh, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, the parable talks about the good seed of God and Satan's bad seed. And the question is, what are you? No? 1 John 3, 10 to 12 said, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does the and practice righteousness is not of Whoever does not practice righteousness, I mean, is not of God, nor he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Truly, this parable calls for righteousness in every believer's heart, because without it, no one will see the Lord, as Hebrews 12, 14 said, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So therefore, as true and faithful Christians, we should keep our righteousness towards God all the time, doing what is always right, not just good, because not all good things are right. Remember that. Proverbs 14, 12 again, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. 1 Corinthians 10.23 said, I have the right to do anything. You say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Romans 12.1-2 said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As you've been born again, you know, conform to the renewing, be transformed to the renewing of your mind. You know, Deuteronomy 6, 17 to 19 said, Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees He has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good the good land that the Lord promised on all to your ancestors trusting out all your enemies before you as the Lord said Proverbs 21:3 says to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice and Psalms 106:3 says blessed are those who act justly who always do what is right and let me close by encouraging you all, dear beloved, that this verse saying that there's a new earth where all righteousness, righteous people of God has been prepared for. 11, uh, 2 Peter 3.13 Nevertheless, we according to His promise, look for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness 
dwells. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Glory be to God. The peace of God be with you all. God bless our family, the TJM. Thank you. you